Okay, so we are going to shift to regional connectivity and some of the concepts around that and some of the modeling, again, that the Nature Conservancy has done um, to create a spatially explicit model that helps us understand areas that might be important for this larger scale movement of organisms in, in light of climate change. So we know in general that population ranges have shifted. These shifts have been common and widespread in, in past episodes of major climate change events. And they've already been detected for hundreds of plants and animal species with the current um, climate change event. So this regional flow analysis provides a generalized model um, of movement in the north, south, and east, west directions. It includes a preference for movement upslope and northward um, as confirmed by patterns of migration. So um, again, what, what we understand about resilient and connected lands. You guys now understand terrestrial resilience for, for local resilience. And um, this model is more about resilience and regional connectivity for larger scale movements. Um, so what we know with climate change is that there will be a tendency for upslope movement of organisms for northward latitudinal movement um, for long-term adjustments, and also for movement along riparian corridors that offer cooler and moister habitat um, in the face of climate change. So from a land protection perspective, what are some of the strategies for addressing regional connectivity? Um, the model that TNC created defines a few different types of areas, areas that we would refer to as diffuse flow, which are areas that are extremely intact and connected natural habitats that can facilitate a high level of, um, of movement of organisms in them. So that movement we refer, refer to as flow. So high levels of sort of dispersed flow. And then our model also um, identifies areas of constrained flow. So what are the areas where large quantities of flow are concentrated through a narrow uh, natural habitat? And because of their importance in maintaining flow across a large network, these pinpoints are really good um, candidates for, for land conservation and even for um, permanent land conservation and fee ownership. And then we have areas of constrained flow. These are areas of low flow that are, um, that are neither constrained nor fully blocked. There are areas present. These areas present a real conservation challenge. In some cases, um, we can restore, um, for instance, a riparian network that might present a good option. Um, so concentrating the flow and creating a linkage in some areas might be one of our best options for, for those areas of constrained flow. And then we have blocked and low flow areas where little flow gets through and it's consequently deflected um, around those features. So that might, some of these are going to be important for restoration where restoring native vegetation or altering road infrastructure might help to reestablish some historic connections. Um, one of the recommendations is keeping natural areas intact and preventing flow from becoming concentrated is a, um, important, an important goal. So here again, constrained flow um, on the map, you can see these are areas where large quantities of flow are constrained through a narrow area. Constrained flow, areas of low flow that are neither concentrated nor fully blocked. And then blocked or low flow, 
are areas that might be important for um, the restoration of native vegetation. And then riparian, riparian climate corridors. These are areas um, that are floodplains and zones along water bodies. They serve as an interface between terrestrial and aquatic systems. And they can be extremely important um, for protecting and restoring these intact riparian floodplain areas that serve as natural corridors that are gonna facilitate the movement of plants and animals um, linearly and in some cases in that, that northward direction. Um, and animals are often gonna be attracted to these types of areas because of the cooler and moister habitat that we have in, in riparian um, climate corridors. So some researchers have taken some preliminary results from TNC's regional connectivity model um, to understand you know, how this plays out on the landscape. So this is an example of one such study in the West Virginia, um, Pennsylvania region, where they examined major road crossings in areas of constrained flow um, from the regional flow data set. They identified roads that blocked the greatest flow and formed barriers to range shifts and species movements. Um, there were 201 areas where major roads intersected with areas of, of concentrated regional flow. And that road flow crossings um, were greatest in this analysis, actually, I guess it was for the whole East Coast in Pennsylvania, followed by Florida, Georgia, and Quebec. But um, it certainly paints a picture of where future future work and connectivity and altering infrastructure could be really powerful in connecting, creating connected corridors for species to move. And so speaking of that, um, I've got a second study here that I thought you all would find interesting because it does focus in on vertebrates and fo focuses specifically on, on road crossings for vertebrates and the, the impact of roads um, as a barrier to movement on species. The book more than once mentions the Wildlands Network. Um, that's a group that I've worked with professionally over the years, and I appreciate the work that they do um, to, to think about connectivity on the landscape and what that means for, for wildlife and vertebrate wildlife. So in this particular study, the Wildlands Network um, looked at modeled um, road crossings for, for large species and for smaller vertebrate species. The case that they made for this work is that um, just in North Carolina alone, there are 4 million miles of roads on these roads. Collisions kill up to 1 million vertebrates each day. North Carolina alone experienced over 61,000 wildlife vehicle crashes resulting in 20 human fatalities, 3,400 injuries, and 149 million in damages. And you probably get the case that they're making here. This is not just about wildlife connectivity. It's also about human health and safety um, to create safe passages for wildlife. Also protects drivers on the roads. So wildlife underpasses and Overpasses have been proven to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions um, up to 80 to 90 percent, and they pay for themselves when they're installed at collision hotspots. And they can also restore connectivity, they can reduce wildlife vehicle collisions, and they can improve public safety. So it's a lot of common sense going into these. So the Wildlands Network mapped roads um, and created a model to help us understand how to prioritize where we should have road cross crossings for wildlife. Some of the factors that they looked at were traffic volume along these roads. Um, they used a figure of, of annual average daily traffic. They looked at the speed it, the speed limit on the roads, another indicator that was uh, 
help predict when there were going to be wildlife uh, human collisions. And they looked at the type of median along the roads, jury barriers, guardrails, um, and other positive barriers that actually inhibit movement of animals across that road. They looked at the um, wildlife vehicle coll collision hotspots. Um, so 2.5 collisions per 0.25 mile radius per year is considered a hotspot. And then they had a couple of other models that they brought in, including black bear connectivity. Where do we think bears are moving um, across the landscape in North Carolina? Where do we have rare and or endangered species hotspots? And where do we have areas that are already protected on both sides of the road? So areas that are either in state or federal ownership or under conservation easement, where it would make more sense to place the wildlife road crossing because you know that that natural habitat is likely to be there in the future as well to help facilitate that movement. In the small, Species model, they looked at um, many of the same factors that the traf traffic volume, they looked at road width, um, again, the type of median. In this model, they looked at timber rattlesnake connectivity, where do we have the top 10% flow of um, timber rattlesnakes. They looked at a box turtle model called box turtle centrality model. And again, they looked at rare endemic, endemic or endangered species hotspots. Um, they looked at nearby wetlands, which were a good predictor for small, for small species movement. And again, they looked at protect, protected lands on both sides of the road. And so this is an example of um, identified road crossings and the type of data that, that we can pull from that when we look at why a certain area might have been prioritized for a future road crossing. So here we've got two potential road crossing spots. One of them is a high traffic area. It has adjacent protected lands on one side of the road. It has a high box turtle centrality, high timber rattlesnake movement potential, black bear connectivity, and also um, natural heritage element occurrences, so rare and threatened species. Um, the second modeled area for as a potential priority area showed uh, the a lane width that was appropriate for movement, protected areas on both sides of the roads, high timber rattlesnake and black bear connectivity, and again, uh, natural heritage element occurrences, so rare and threatened species. And then a really cool application of this particular study is that we know um, there's no real mystery about North Carolina's um, improvement plan. So where do they, they plan to do road improvements in the future? They forecast a 10-year road project prior, prioritization list. And this is, again, a spatially explicit version that facilitates um, the ability of conservation organizations to align the Department of Transportation's project priorities with some of these wildlife considerations. So it would make a lot of sense to make the appeal for a wildlife crossing, be able to present some of the um, findings from, from the prioritization model at the time that the Department of Transportation is planning to do a major road improvement or project. Um, across the state. So I hope that was an enlightening case study for you guys. Maybe some of you will find some use for that um, in the future. So I'm going to stop the recording now.